Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction on David Simmons. Um, let's see. David um, is, was a member of the original underscore Big Payette Lake Water Quality Council from 1993 to 2004. David joined the reestablished council in 2019 after retirement and is now the president. He has worked on water quality and public land management issues in Idaho since the 1980s and served several terms on the board of the Idaho Conservation League. Uh, David, to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Gary. And uh, on behalf of the Big Pay Lake Water Quality Council, uh, thanks to everyone for taking an interest in the lakes and the watershed. Uh, and um, let me get my uh, slides going here. and uh, jump right in. Okay, a quick word on uh, who we are. And as you can see, uh, contact information in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, please check out our website. Uh, we've got uh, lots of good information about Payette Lake there, and uh, also about the uh, University of Idaho study that we're uh, currently helping to uh, support. So um, when I was uh, asked to do this today, uh, the first thing I thought of was uh, 1993. And um, when uh, Davis's cows uh, walked down to the reservoir and, uh, and took a drink and uh, killed over dead. But um, because that's when it seemed like people really started taking an interest in water quality. And there's a much bigger picture though. And uh, there's, there's really two big lakes and a big watershed uh, and they have some things in common and uh, some real differences. So I'll boil it down to three factors that set the stage for water quality, uh, geology, climate, and people. Uh, very simplistic diagram, but uh, um, you know, this is just to help us get our heads around it. Uh, so, um, and you know, just help us see how the pieces fit together and how we got where we are today. So of course the geology came first and uh, this is the, uh, the only comic relief we're going to get today. So there, there it is. Um, but uh, we need to go way back to see uh, uh, how we got where we are. And I don't know if anybody else remembers Mr. Peabody and Sherman from Bullwinkle, but uh, that was one of my favorite shows. Uh, so it uh, uh, makes me think about how important it is to look back and uh, let history uh, uh, help us do the right thing. But I'm going to keep it very brief and uh, oversimplified, so I hope you'll uh, bear with me there. So how did we get a watershed in the first place? Um, uh, I'm going to cover 100 million years in about a minute and a half. <clears throat> so between 150 and 50 million years ago, the Farallon Plate out in the Pacific wedged itself under the North American Plate. And it pushed it up, um, which helps explain why we live in the mountains instead of at the beach. And the beach used to be just east of Riggins, by the way. This also uh, caused some wrinkles here and there. So we have uh, mostly north-south orientation of mountains and valleys. And in our local area, there's a feature called the Western Idaho Shear Zone that runs from the Owyhees uh, north up to around the Clearwater River. It's uh, generally along West Mountain and that helped shape the west side of Long Valley. So uh, mostly just to our east, the Idaho Batholith is a big plateau of granite that bubbled up about 80 million years ago from the one plate running under the other. 
Uh, and as we'll see, that granite does matter. So Long Valley is really the low spot between the Batholith and West Mountain. And it's the smaller oval in the middle of the screen there, uh, just in sort of context. Um, you can see McCall's at the top um, and uh, Boise way down at the bottom for, for scale. So uh, let's fast forward <laughs> through the next 40 million years or so. Um, and that was the time when the fault movement, erosion, and glaciers finished shaping and filling Long Valley. So climate is next, but it segues right into people. The ice ages came and went, and I said this would be quick. Uh, about 20,000 years ago, the final Pinedale glaciation of the last ice age wound down. And that was mostly uh, uh, seen in the north end of the watershed, where the Big Pay Payette Lake and Little Payette Lakes formed behind natural dams, uh, glacial moraines. And they are still there. The last 12,000 years were mostly a warm interglacial period when the watershed became more biologically productive and habitable. Columbian mammoths that had made themselves at home in the region died out, and native people found the valley a good place to hunt and fish in the summer. So people have been in the, in the valley here for thousands of years. But let's jump to recent history now. From around 1850 to 1920, when Finnish immigrants, among others, moved in, and the sheep eater Shoshone and the Nez Perce people were displaced. In 1911, a map of Long Valley looked pretty different than today. You can see on the right side of the screen, uh, there was no Lake Cascade. There was no town of Cascade. Uh, Donnelly wasn't there yet. Roseberry was, uh, was the big hub in the middle of the valley. So the Payette and Snake Rivers had no dams in those days and sockeye swam in, uh, salmon swam from the Pacific to Payette Lake to spawn. There was a commercial sockeye cannery at Lardo near the present Shore Lodge. In the 1890s, the water was clear enough to see 27 feet down. It's not as good today. DEQ says about 14 to 20 feet in deep water. And it was close to zero near shore during the 2020 algae bloom, according to one diver that we spoke to. So the railroad from Emmett to McCall started in 1914, which kicked off large scale logging and summer tourism along with livestock shipping. And it's fair to say that the, li the railroad accelerated human impacts in the valley. So then dams were built for irrigation storage and flood control starting with Big Payette Lake in 1920, Black Canyon and Little Payette Lake dams in 1924, then Cascade Dam from 1942 to 48, and finally Hell's Canyon Complex in the 50s and 60s. As a result, all the salmon runs were cut off. By this point, the watershed was pretty different from any time in the last 10 to 20,000 years. The shallow Cascade Reservoir filled up over good soil with lots of nutrients, got more nutrients and sediment from erosion of granite soils in the watershed. You remember that batholith from 80 million years ago, uh, from sewage effluent, agriculture, and a fish hatchery. Eutrophication, uh, that is nutrient enrichment plant and al algae overgrowth and oxygen depletion quickly got started. In less than 50 years, toxic algae blooms began to kill cattle and fish. Well, that got our attention. Uh, this timeline for Cascade Lake covers a lot, but let's just say that studies were done and the lake was listed by EPA for failing to support beneficial uses under the Clean Water Act. Agencies and local people did and continue to do lots of projects to improve water quality. That's all good, but the lake is still eutrophic 
It suffers from annual toxic algae blooms and public health advisories. Shoreline and upland erosion, water sports, development, nutrient recycling, and a war warmer climate make for an uphill battle. So Payette Lake is a different kind of lake with a different story, but it hasn't been spared from human influence. The shoreline was built up with city streets and homes with septic systems. The lake was used as a mill pond while the watershed was logged. Lake studies in 1969, 1975, and 1982 showed oxygen deficits and near shore bacterial pollution. The sewer district was organized and the lakeshore sewer system was completed in the 1980s. But impacts and effects continue to be felt. And by the early 1990s, Peter Johnson convinced the Idaho legislature to create the Big Pay Lake Water Quality Council to study the lake and develop a management plan. That plan and its limited monitoring program are still in place. In 1994, 52% of the watershed burned in the Blackwell fire. Runoff from the burn hit the lake the following year and algae blooms were spotted. Long-term monitoring shows some stability, but the data is limited. More data would help reveal whether the lake is sliding toward a eutrophic degraded state. The University of Idaho study to examine shoreline erosion and nutrient pollution began in 2020. Also during summer 2020 and likely in some prior years, there was a widespread nearshore algae bloom, along with turbidity, bad smell and taste that really affected contact recreation and some private water systems. So it might be helpful to summarize what's similar and what's different about the two lakes um, so let's take a quick look. I'm not going to read you that whole list, but somehow all of these factors tie into geology, climate, and people. Um, but I do want to point out sort of the action items. Uh, the, the last four bullet points, low funding levels for water quality monitoring and studies, vol voluntary water quality measures that have had some success, but it's been limited. Leadership and education on fresh, freshwater ecosystems is needed at a higher level, I think, than we've had in the past. And we do have dated lake management plans that uh, could use some updating. So there are a lot of differences between the lakes as well, and I'll, I'll touch on those briefly. The history characteristics and impacts uh, for the two lakes uh, diverge somewhat. Payette Lake, it's deep, it's old. Um, it's been recognized as a, a, a resort recreation area um, since 1926 by the legislature. It's uh, for, as, as Bob Giles noted, it's the public drinking water supply for anywhere from 3,000 to 20,000 residents and visitors. Uh, there are algae blooms uh, that have been observed, but they're not well studied or understood uh, the, the way that uh, they perhaps are in Lake Cascade. And as I said, fire burned 52% of the watershed in 1994, and that was a pretty hot fire the effects of that um, uh, may linger in terms of uh, particularly water temperatures. So uh, another reason that we do need more monitoring. Lake Cascade is a shallow reservoir. It's about 20 miles long and it's only 73 years old. Has recurring incidents and health advisories with uh, toxic blue-green algae blooms, also known as cyanobacteria. 
it does have major seasonal and irrigation storage lake level changes. It was designated as water quality limited with a TMDL, that's a pollution budget by the EPA. And it does have significant impacts from agriculture. So where does that leave us? There are elephants in the room and um, that I, I knew that mammoth would come in handy. Um, but to be way too simplistic, the elephants in the room are geology, climate, and people. Uh, for geology, the watersheds are mostly uh, erosive granite. The sediment and the nutrients go downhill. The lakes are at the bottom of the hill. For climate, it's the effects of a warming climate. We have uh, changes in water temperature, quantity, and timing that are affecting the lakes. We've got more and bigger wildfires and changing vegetation in the watershed. And people, uh, no offense uh, to any person or elephant on, on this, but uh, we're one of the elephants in the room. We build dams, we change the landscape, we put the watershed to work and we play on the lakes. But we may use history and science to understand the facts and avoid repeating past mistakes. And we can choose to solve even very large water quality problems, or we could just give up. So with that, I will uh, turn it back to Gary. And uh, I want to thank you all for listening. I hope that was useful.